Michael, the uh, whole area of, of sex and gender is a, is a hot topic politically. Uh, obviously, sexuality is very important to human beings and is important culturally, as we know, in so many different ways. What kind of contribution can the way of thinking in philosophy of bio biology bring to discussions of sex, sexuality, and gender? Well, I suppose there's various issues which come up here. Uh, sex itself. I mean, does, for instance, being male or female make a difference? I mean, we know full well that in our society and many other, other societies, it's, it, we're bad. Look at the Muslims. I mean, look at the, I mean, look at the Taliban, the way they're behaving and how women are clearly inferior, not allowed to go to school and all of that sort of thing. Whereas males are, you know, have the freedom. Males can wear a hat or not if they don't want to. In Iran, the young women who are not wearing, you know, scarves, head scarves, are in big trouble. They're being beaten up, you know, we're in jail. So there are obviously issues right there dealing with, even with the basic sexuality between males and females. Now, obviously, there's other issues like, for instance, homosexuality, for instance, pedophilia, why it might be wrong to be prejudiced against homosexuals, Look, why, if you're not prejudiced against pedophiles, equally. Mm. I mean, can we just be tolerant and say, well, this guy likes young boys. That's okay. That's okay. That's his taste. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, we've just seen that in, in Baltimore, uh, what, uh, 600 cases of young people, 18 or younger, being sexually abused by priests. Now, that isn't, you know, 600 people in Baltimore between the ages of, let's say, 18 and 36 have sex with a, a person of the same sex. We're inclined to say, by and large, that's your business. By and large, that is not your business. That's morally evil. So I think there's, we get, we philosophers get plunged right into these things. Before we even get to the more esoteric things like, is sex something we find or something we construct? Should we make a difference between sex and between gender? Is gender a construction rather than something we find? So yes, there's, there's a host of philosophical problems there. Okay, so let's go, go, go into some of them uh, uh, re regarding uh, the, uh, the, the sex gender problem. Uh, that's an issue in society. How, would have, how does a philosopher, a philosopher of biology look at that, that issue in terms of of what one is born with and what the gender one identifies with? Mm -hmm. Well, I think obviously if you're, clearly if you're somebody fairly liberal like myself, I want to say it's their business, not mine. Mm -hmm. And obviously some people do feel that way. I, mean, I, I don't, mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it's been like. But you know, some people want to be racing drivers. I can't imagine <laughs> what it's like to be yeah. like that. Right. You know what Sky I mean? Skydivers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really and truly, I mean, some people want to be urologists. The thought, I, mean, I can imagine being a gynecologist for a week or two, but you know, so the fact, different strokes for different folks. So yeah. at one level, I want to say that. Now, having said that, I do think that we as a group, not just as individual parents, we as a group have a responsibility to younger people, people in difficulty, as we, we do to people, and I'm not saying that transgender is handicapped, but as we do to people who got issues. Let's just use that in a, a neutral sense. And I think since we're dealing with transgender and we're dealing with people, let's say, by and large, we're dealing with people, let's say, under 21, under 18. I think that we've got at least some moral responsibility to learn what we can about these things. For instance, is it the case that when somebody is eight or nine says, oh, I wish I were a boy. I wish I, I always want to play boys games. That means that at 13, they should be given hormones, hormone suppressant. Or is this some, something which is fairly common, but by the time they're 15, you know, they say, well, I was a tremendous tomboy as a, a youth, but oh my God, I really love George. He's just, so, so I, I do think that we have an obligation, not simply to say, oh yes, dear, that's what you want, that, but, but that's the same with everything, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if, if somebody says, you know, oh, I, I mean, a middle-class person, and the kid says, oh, I want to be a lavatory attendant when I grow up. <laughs> well, yes, and that, if you end up as one, I'll respect you for that. <laughs> but, dear, have you ever thought there might be something, a possibility of doing a bit more education, <laughs> becoming 
a school teacher, or, you know, without even being a university professor. You know? So clearly, I think that we, not just as individuals, but as a group, have responsibility. Of course we do. Mm. I mean, of course we, we make schools available and make sure that kids go to school. Oh, and look at that story that we're coming out of New York about all those kids in you know, the Jew, Orthodox Jewish schools who are not getting mathematics. Right. They're not even learning to speak English. Yeah. Now, haven't all of us said at some level, they're not our kids, but they're part of our society. We have an obligation to those children mm. to try to. So that's very much how I, I approach the transgender Situation. How about how about women uh, in terms of women in society from a, a biological point of view, philosophy of biology? Well, I, 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 for me, this is a, a, an easier thing to to handle because I I personally think I can see more clearly what's going on there. Clearly, societies think of the Taliban, think of Florida, mm -hmm. you know, who regard women as second rate. I mean, they say they don't, but they do. Uh, no. Okay, at some level, one could see why this was the case. I mean, women used to be, you know, have lots of kids, all of these sorts of things, uh, and everything like that. Uh, and so men would go out and work, and women would stay home and do the laundry and do the cooking and that sort of thing. And so you've got this kind of, not necessarily at home. I mean, Charles Darwin may have been the big figure outside, but when you looked at home, it was Emma Darwin who, who ruled the roost around there. Uh, let me tell you with no uncertain terms. No. The thing is, what we know is that up to 10,000 years ago, we were hunter-gatherers. And it's pretty clear that in a hunter-gatherer society, the, to use it, an offensive phrase but properly, there's no place for weak, weak sisters. Mm -hmm. Women had to play a full role as much as men. But they may not have been as figured physically strong, but while the men were out hunting, women were making traps or something, no less skilled, no less calling on abilities, no less worthy than making a trap to catch small animals rather than going out and trying to stab big animals. So I think, I, I'm, not, I'm not alone on this, that up to about 10,000 years ago, males and females were more or less equal and regarded that way. Then, then of course came agriculture and huge population explosion, very good to have lots of children out there working in the fields. Up to this point, Clearly, a lot of infanticide went on, but now kids are a value, as they were in the Industrial Revolution. Till then, you, on the farm, you were careful about how many kids you had. You went into work in a factory. The kids were the ones who could do this, unlike mm. the, 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 the grown-ups, so they were a value. And so what happened then was that more children, of course, women then were, let's say, tied down. They got to rear children. They got to look after things, washing, all of them. And I think this went right through the 19th into the 20th century. And then things changed. But the point is, they didn't change because of genetic refashioning. Mm -hmm. They changed because of culture. One, I can still remember the Roos family got, my mother's a school teacher, but the Roos family got a Bendix washing machine in 1950. Overnight, it transformed my wife's, my mother's life. Weekends, because she was away all week teaching, weekends were spent doing clothes, washing clothes. I mean, literally, all weekend, washing clothes. Get a Benedict's washing machine. Overnight, my mother's life was changed. You, you put them in the Bendix, you went off and did something else, they done, and then you hung them up. I mean, so my mother, you know, was a very intelligent woman, and we were Quakers, so she got into reading, and you know, you know, my parents were obsessed with theology, but that's another matter. But uh, no kidding, I mean, she, her life was changed. And then I went to university, and you know, nice boys only want one thing. <laughs> and girls were told, you know, nice boys only want one thing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I went through, you know, that was the way it was. And then 1965, along came the pill, Oh my God, I started teaching in a university in Canada in 1965. Young women changed, again, literally overnight from saying, no, 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 I've got to keep myself pure to say, why aren't you, come on, let's have go to, no, I'm not saying it's morally good, but it really meant that women were no longer saying, no, 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 I, they were saying, yeah, uh, or they could say, no, I'm not, I, frankly, I'm just not interested, but they were equals. And I think, so what we've seen is culture has changed women's position. I taught at the University of Guelph in Ontario for 35 years. I started in 1965, I ended in 2000 when I came south. 
The University of Guelph has a veterinary college, vet college. In 1965, the incoming group for the students in the vet college was 80 men and a quota of four women. I mean, literally a quota, because I had students who wanted to get in. 92,000 when I left, they took in 100 students. Over 90 were women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over 90 were women. Mm -hmm. And you know, to use a very inappropriate joke, I remember reading a guy once, and I asked, he said, I'm a vet student. And I said, oh my God, are you gay? He laughed, he said, no, but you, everybody asked me that one. <laughs> now, okay, very inappropriate, but you know what I mean? A complete change, sea change. And so obviously now, you know, the veterinary business, certainly in Canada, I think elsewhere, has become dominantly female. And does anybody now say, oh, what a terrible, of course, the, vet, the needs of vets have changed. It's not like all creatures great and small where you're getting up you know, and going to see if you can help Daisy in the middle of the night. Now it's all done by antibiotics and that sort of thing. It's much more small animals and these things. So it has changed. But the point is women are totally, and we see this in medicine too, that women, their role of medicine, uh, uh, slowly it's even happening in philosophy departments. <laughs> slowly it's even, certainly I ran a little program, History and Philosophy of Science, and I'd say two thirds of my students were women. And they've gone on to do very successfully, including one poor woman who now is a curator in a museum in Buffalo where they've just had five, five in five minutes of snow. So <laughs> I'm laughing. 